Well, welcome all to this tutorial. This is the last one for this academic year, and we will start again after summer. Today, we have the pleasure to have Judy Cole with us from the University of California, Irvine. Well, first of all, Irvine has been famous here in Greece because they had this thesaurus language, uh, lingua grecia or whatever it's called. And uh, a lot of people used uh, this tool to study classical Greek. So we are living in interesting times because Judy today will talk about brain and language and bilingualism or multilingualism. It's very interesting. It goes over the classical uh, language acquisition or teaching and learning a foreign language uh, because studies on this area shows us the real function of language. What is language? How do we communicate? Well, we, have the we will have the pleasure to listen to her talk. And at the end, we will talk with her and um, ask questions, present comments, exchange ideas. Thank you, Judy, for accepting our invitation to be with us today. Please go ahead. Thank you so very much. And thank you so very much for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, seminar series. Uh, I'll say a word or two about myself. Um, uh, I am a psycholinguist um, who uses the tools of cognitive neuroscience to investigate the way people learn a second language or third language and the way their minds and brains change as a function of that. Um, I have been doing this work for a very long time in many different places. Um, I'm originally from New York City um, and over a long career that I've had, um, I have worked in many different uh, locations. Uh, I was on the faculty for a long time in Massachusetts. Uh, I then moved to Penn State, where in the middle of Pennsylvania, where I was on the faculty uh, for 22 years and where I was part of a group who founded a, a center for research that focused on bilingualism called the Center for Language Science. Um, in 2016, I had an opportunity to move to California. And move, I moved to California in part because all my family is here, but I also moved here because it was an amazing opportunity uh, to study bilinguals in a place in the US where we actually have quite a lot of linguistic diversity. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about how our research program has really been shaped by encountering the diversity and variation that we see uh, in the way individuals use their languages, however many of them that they happen to have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to ask that you hold questions of clarification. You can ask questions of clarification, but if you have questions of substance that we can talk about them uh, at the end, I'm very happy to uh, take your questions and have discussion. Uh, and I'm also very happy to invite you uh, to contact me afterwards uh, to have any, any further discussion should things come up them. So if it's all right, I will share my screen. And perhaps you can just let me know whether that's all right. Everyone can see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about variation in language experience as a lens 
Um, bilingualism, multilingualism is of interest in its own right. But for many of us who are cognitive scientists, it's become a lens. It's become a tool that is incredibly powerful for understanding the relationship between language and the mind and the brain. And I want to, um, let me just see if I can... I, I want to start by just very quickly acknowledging the contributions of just many people over a long period of time. I've had fantastic students in my lab who've worked with me and gone on to have wonderful careers of their own. I have wonderful collaborators. When you live in places like Pennsylvania in the US for a long time and you want to study bilingualism, you need to have friends and colleagues in many places in the world who are interested in collaborating and sharing their ideas and labs with you. Uh, so I have really been very, very fortunate. Um, and I've also been fortunate to have support uh, from a number of different uh, funding agencies, uh, including the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation in the US. So I'm going to preach to the choir for just a moment, but I don't need to tell you that more people in the world are bilingual than monolingual. But until fairly recently, most research on language and cognition has examined primarily monolingual speakers of a single language and often English as the native language. And from this perspective, bilinguals have been considered to be what I'm calling special in the sense that bilingualism has been thought to complicate the study of language, the mind, and the brain. And of course, what I'm going to do today is argue exactly the opposite. Um, but before I do that, we need to take a moment to place this work in context. And I need to say that here in the US, and I don't want to say anything about the politics in the US now because it is so utterly upsetting and depressing that it's an entire other talk. But the politics in the US on the topic of bilingualism have been very difficult and they have failed to support language learning and failed to support bilingualism. And we see this picture uh, meant to be a joke, but it's not a joke of this Uncle Sam in the US saying, I want you to speak English and English only. Um, in 2017, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences published a very bold report, a commission on language learning, published a report and, and stated quite uh, quite strongly, that English is no longer sufficient as a lingua franca, either at home or abroad. Um, and they projected that by 2050, only 5% of the population in the US will be native English speakers, which from some people's perspective seems like a shockingly tiny number. And just to say that the report that they published and the associated materials are available uh, at this website. Everything is available online and it's possible to download these materials for free. So what's the situation in the U.S. with respect to bilingualism? This is a map of the U.S. It was published in work by uh, Sarah Serain and J.G. Luck. Um, and what you see is this gigantic blue map. And the blue is English only. Um, what they did in the study is they assessed the percentage of people uh, who had a language other than English at home in different locations in the US. And what you see is most of the US is very is blue, so very low percentage of a language other than English. But then what you see is you see this rim, this sort of red yellow rim around the uh, edges of the country where we have much more bilingualism, much greater linguistic diversity. What they did in this study and those uh, those fuchsia and, and green uh, dots and squares on the on the map, they did a survey where they surveyed people living in these different locations and they asked them how important do you think bilingualism is? And people who lived in places where there wasn't much bilingualism didn't think it was very important. People who lived in the brighter areas of the country thought it was very important. Now what's critical is that um, those of us who now live in the, those 
hotter, what I'm calling the hot spots in the country, the red and the yellow. Um, and I'm here in Los Angeles right now uh, in Southern California. So I am right sort of here. And what, uh, what we see is that the people who are in these hotspots are individuals who have a language other than English and who learned that language at home. And in the American Academy report, they did a survey to look at where English speaking adults who are fluent in another language acquired that other language. And what they found is 75.5% of those people, almost everyone who had a language other than English acquired it at home. And I want us to think for just one moment about what that means about studying bilingualism, because what it means is that heritage speakers who acquired a home language and then went, went and lived in a community where they had to acquire uh, the majority language in the community, those heritage speakers are actually the majority of bilinguals in the U.S. We often don't think of them as the majority or typical bilinguals. We think of second language learners who may be as teenagers or in school acquired a foreign language. Um, but in fact, um, heritage speakers are the majority. And going forward, I want to argue that the variation we see in their language experience, which is quite great, um, has to be a major factor of interest in research on bilingualism. Now, I want to try today to illustrate why I think that's the case. Um, within the language and learning sciences, there has been some recognition now that um, bilingualism is not just a complication. Uh, this is a, a cartoon arguing that monolingualism is the illiteracy of the 21st century, but what we've come to see is that bilingualism is a tool for revealing the workings of language, the mind, and the brain. And in the last two or three decades, there's been an upsurge of research on bilingualism. And that what you see on the left is uh, are some data from the web of science just showing papers published on bilingualism. And you see this big increase. Um, and what you have on the right is just a depiction of a brain, sort of a, a model of a brain, arguing that what we see is that being bilingual changes the architecture of your brain. Um, and we now see many, many, many studies that are investigating what the consequences are of acquiring and using two languages. But what we need to ask is we need to ask what causes these consequences and whose brains are being changed? How does this happen? And I, I will just take a quick time out to say, because I know that in, in the past, there has been, uh, there are many different views about, and I want to say some confusion about who's bilingual. Um, so way back, we used to think that only people who were early and balanced simultaneous bilinguals were true bilinguals. And we've now... Um, we, we, we've now abandoned that view. Um, we want to embrace the variation in language experience and review studies that compare the performance of individuals who compared, acquired the two languages early, some who inquire, acquired the two languages late, some who may have a home language and have a community language, some who are learners in process. And we're going to take every version of multiple language use as being a form of bilingualism. Individuals who use me two spoken languages or have a spoken language and a signed language. We're going to see many, many different forms and versions of bilingualism, and we're going to be open to considering what we can learn from examining all of them. So in the press, um, we often see that there are reports that bilingualism is good for you, that bilingualism is good for your brain. We hear about the benefits of bilingualism. Uh, speaking another language is good for your brain. Um, bilingualism is like a mental gymnasium for your brain. Um, at the same time, we hear from those who think that these advantages or, or benefits have been overstated. Um, and there's been a lot of fuss within the academic community, within the scientific community, about whether these claims that bilingualism produces positive consequences can really be trusted. 
And uh, one of the things that I want to ask today and focus on today is to ask why there's controversy about the consequences of bilingualism. Very few people are going to argue that it's not useful pragmatically to speak more than one language. The question here is whether the use of a more than one language comes to really deeply change your brain and your mind and to give you cognitive benefits that you might not otherwise experience if you speak one language alone. I'm going to argue today that one reason why there's controversy on this issue is that we have not adequately characterized the variation among bilingual speakers, nor the variation in the context in which two or more languages are learned and used. And so what I'm going to do today is try to illustrate very briefly, very quickly, um, some of what we've learned in this recent upsurge of research on bilingualism. I'm going to go quickly. I'm going to describe things at a very superficial level in some ways. I am very happy to share papers and references and deeper uh, uh, resources with you uh, to follow up on any of the particular issues that I, I raise. Um, so the two things I want to talk about today are language. Um, and, and I often say something at the beginning of talks that sounds a little, a little bit foolish, but I'm going to say this, which is that in, in thinking about the consequences of bilingualism, Many people have forgotten about language and the idea that bilingualism is about language. Um, and one of the things that we and others have discovered in this last period of research is that we've discovered that proficient bilinguals are not monolingual-like in their native language. Um, and that's a bit shocking for some. The idea here is that being, becoming bilingual is not just about learning a second language and becoming proficient in that second language. All of that is very important. But it's also about how the native um, or dominant language um, is open to change itself and to the influence of the second language language. We're going to argue that the native language and the second language come to live in the same place in the brain, and they influence one another, not just in learning, but also across the entire lifespan. Um, and the second focus is going to be about context and variation itself. I'm going to argue that the dynamics of cross-language interaction and the resulting consequences are going to depend on the form of bilingualism, who the bilinguals are, where they learned and used the two languages, and who they speak to. And so our goal is to try to develop a causal account to understand not only whether there are consequences of bilingualism, but what is it that bilinguals do that produces these consequences. So we need to place research on bilingualism in a context that acknowledges the individual, social, and political realities of language use. We need to understand who is bilingual and how contexts for language learning and language use vary. So heritage speakers of a home language become crucial if we hope to answer this question. We are beginning to have data that demonstrates that not all bilinguals are the same and taking those differences into account is consequential. And the goal of my talk today is really to just lay out this approach uh, in a preliminary way and in a way that's humble and to try to describe some of the emerging findings and some of our excitement about where we think this research might go. So what are the consequences of bilingualism across the lifespan? I'm going to very quickly sample some of the evidence. I'm being very selective. Uh, anyone out there who has contributed to this research, I apologize. I'm not going to be able to be comprehensive or necessarily um, cite everyone or, or cite your favorite uh, resources, but I want to just illustrate the main points. We see early in life, in infancy, there is fantastic research on what happens to baby brains when babies are exposed to more than one language from birth. Although in the popular culture, people sometimes think, oh, that's going to confuse babies. It's going to really change in a, in a difficult way. 
their course of language and cognitive development, what we see is exactly the opposite. That according to Laura Ann Petito, the phrase that they've used in their research is perceptual wedge. The idea is that acquiring, being exposed to more than one language from birth, creates an openness, a wedge that opens the language system so that babies exposed to more than one language from early on are going to be more open to speech, not only in the language they hear, but in other languages. They are going to become better learners of language. And that all happens in the first year of life. Uh, the picture at the bottom right of the screen is a picture from some of Patricia Kuhl's uh, research from uh, Naha Farhan Ramirez's work. Um, this is a baby in a Meg machine. It looks very ominous, but it's not invasive. Um, and this is a baby whose brain is being scanned while they're hearing speech. And what this research shows is that not only are the brains of bilingually exposed babies more open, uh, to speech from not only native, but from non-native uh, speech sounds, but that the babies who are exposed to more than one language also begin to develop areas of the brain that are associated with executive function, associated with the ability to navigate their way in these higher level cognitive processes. And so this is all very exciting. And there's a whole area of research on baby brains and on early speech perception uh, that's really very, very compelling. If we go up the lifespan, life continuum a little bit, we can look at young adults. This is some work from Jubin Abitulebi's lab in Milan. And uh, what they've done here is to have a group of bilinguals and monolinguals perform a cognitive task. The task is shown on the right. This is the flanker task, and you see the arrow that's pointed in one direction. The task is a, it's not a language task. It's a very simple cognitive task. You see an arrow, and your decision is, does it point to the right or the left? If it points to the right, press a right button. If it points to the left, press a left button. And what they do is, while people are performing that task, they scan their brains. And so they're looking at functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, while they're performing this cognitive task. And the trick in the experiment is you can take that arrow and you can surround it by other arrows that are all consistently pointing in the same direction or in conflict. So some pointing one direction, some pointing another, where it gets to be a little bit confusing. And what they ask is, how do bilinguals solve this problem? How do monolinguals solve this problem? It turns out that monolinguals and bilinguals use the same area of the brain to solve the problem. What you see in, this, uh, in the brain scans shown on this slide is activation in the area of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, or the ACC. This is an area of the brain that's been associated with uh, conflict resolution, conflict monitoring. But the critical point is that do you see how for the monolinguals you have this bright yellow area of the brain that's lit up whereas for the bilinguals you actually have to squint to see that activation in the same place what is what is this brain scanning show well what this shows is that bilinguals seem to need less activation of the same areas of the brain relative to monolinguals to solve the same problem. The claim is that bilinguals, by virtue of their life experience with the two languages, come to be able to resolve conflict in a way that's more general. And so they're using the same area of the brain, but they're more efficient in how they can activate those cognitive resources. Uh, if we go up the uh, life continuum a bit more to old age, um, we see what is perhaps some of the most compelling evidence about bilingualism, which has to do with what are the apparent neuroprotections for 
aging individuals if they are bilingual. This is another study by Abu Chalebi's group. Um, and what they do here is this is not fMRI, this is structural imaging. They're looking at the actual structure of the brain. And you can look at the GMV is gray matter volume. We can look at how dense is the gray matter volume in a particular area of the brain that may be associated with important cognitive functions. And the critical point in these graphs is that you see for the monolinguals, what's on the, the graph is very small, but you see on the x-axis age. Um, and so what you see is that as people age, you see this declining function, this sort of depressing function, but in fact, it's normal cognitive aging. Um, there's a lot of variation, but you see this decline. And so the idea is that there is a reduction in gray matter as individuals age. But look at the graph on the bottom. The graph on the bottom is for the bilinguals in the same looking at the same brain areas. And what you see is that there's, again, there's a lot of variation. But what we see is that for bilinguals, there doesn't seem to be a decline, meaning that the bilinguals, it looks like the bilinguals are being protected by their bilingualism with respect to the integrity of the brain. And this has been shown now for gray matter. It's been shown for white matter connectivity, which is more about your sort of what's been the metaphor for those of you who don't do cognitive neurosciences. It's more about the sort of telephone wires, the sort of connections between the different areas of the brain are more likely to be intact for older bilinguals and for older monolinguals. But perhaps the most provocative evidence of all comes from evidence on dementia. And these studies have shown that bilingualism, and very important to be clear, bilingualism does not protect you against dementia. Um, however, bilingualism appears to protect individuals against the symptoms of dementia. So the symptoms of dementia are quite debilitating, and individuals who are bilingual seem to only report to the clinic with the symptoms of dementia four to five years later than their monolingual counterparts. So for four to five years, individuals who are bilingual appear to be able to compensate in ways that protect them. So they are developing the disease, but their bilingualism is providing a level of protection that monolingual brains don't seem to have. And it's important to point out that there is no drug that we know of that has this effect. Um, and at the point where they're diagnosed, their brains are actually more diseased than those of monolinguals, suggesting that they have been managing in the face of the disease and that their bilingualism has provided them with a level of mental resilience that the monolinguals don't have. So what are the causal mechanisms that produce these effects? These effects are really all fantastic. And now the question is, where do they come from? It's wonderful to demonstrate them, and we, we can demonstrate them, we can argue about what they are and what the scope looks like, but we need to understand where we think it, they may come from. And the argument here is that bilingualism creates cognitive and neural reserve and resilience. Um, but how to uh, develop a causal account? We argue that we need to look at the interplay of language processes themselves, and the mechanisms of cognitive control. How do bilinguals engage cognition when they use the two languages in learning, in their life once they've become proficient, and in different contexts as they move from one context to the other. And we are going to speculate that the very same dynamics that may be involved in language immersion are actually the dynamics that are involved in resilience in the face of dementia. So a word on where we started this entire enterprise, and this is a review paper that we wrote um, a while ago, and uh, it's a paper called Two Languages in Mind, Bilingualism is a Tool to Investigate Language Cognition in the Brain, and what we did in this paper is we tried to ask the question, what have we learned? What have we discovered about bilingualism? Well, one of the things we've discovered and, and I've often argued that this is really the most profound discovery in this last two decade, three decade period, is that both languages are always active and competing. The two languages do not act 
individually, separately, and uh, ignoring uh, one another, uh, it's not possible for bilinguals to turn one language off. Bilinguals may not be aware that both languages are percolating at the same time, um, but the evidence suggests that they're both available. The second discovery, as I mentioned earlier, is that the native language changes in response to learning and using a second language. Um, the native language is not stable. Um, I think so much of our theorizing in linguistics and psycholinguistics has made the assumption that once you acquire a native language in early childhood, you've got it, and that's it, and that's with you for the rest of your life. And what we've learned more recently is that's simply not the case. And finally, as I've been illustrating in the examples that I just described, the consequences of bilingualism are not limited to language. They spill over to aspects of brain function and cognition. And the argument is that what we're seeing is a reflection of the consequences of how bilinguals negotiate competition more generally. And that competition is hypothesized to have come from uh, competition across their two languages. And so how does this work? Um, the metaphor that I and others have used is that the bilingual is a mental juggler. Both languages come online regardless of the requirement or intention to use one language alone. This is a little schematic of a Dutch English speaker trying to name a very common object in the Netherlands, a bicycle. You see bicycles everywhere. Um, and if you're a Dutch English speaker, well, you can call it feats, which is the word for bike in Dutch, or you can call it bike in English or in any one of the other languages that you may know. The point is that whether you're aware of it or not, we now have experimental evidence that shows quite clearly that both languages are in play and competing with one another. And so this parallel activation creates interactions. They influence one another and they also compete. Sometimes the two languages converge where we may have cognates, for example, that are the words that refer to the same ideas in both languages where the translations are essentially the same. Other times, very often, they conflict. There are differences in phonology, differences in, in grammar. There are differences at every level, and those differences conflict. And one of the things a bilingual needs to do is to juggle that information so it doesn't impede the ability to be able to speak proficiently. So the original story about all of this was really quite simple. Bilinguals draw on domain general mechanisms of cognition to keep the balls in the air. They become expert mental jugglers, and that expertise draws on cognitive resources. But the question is, how? And how does the variation across bilingual experience? There's so many different types of bilinguals. Do all bilinguals do this in the very same way? And the critical uh, point that I've made about language, and I've said this already this morning, is that um, most of the research on these cognitive consequences has not examined language, has not asked how are language processes different for different types of bilinguals, um, how important is variation, and how important is the context in which the languages are used. So past studies have documented these effects of the dominant first language on the second, and we know that in uh, linguistics and in psycholinguistics, there's a very long tradition of research on language transfer, arguing that your strong first language transfers to your weaker or newer second language. Um, and this idea is not really that, con I mean, there, we have a lot of controversy about exactly how that works and exactly what the scope might be, but we see these effects everywhere. Um, we see it for um, proficient speakers, we see it for learners, we see it for speakers whose languages are structurally distinct, like Chinese and English or American Sign Language and English, and we see it at all levels of language. We see it at the lexicon, the phonology, the grammar. In much of our research, what we've done is to turn the tables. We ask not how the first language affects the second, but how the second comes to affect the first. And so this becomes a story about the native or dominant language. And the argument that we and others have made more recently is that 
the regulation or control of the native or dominant language may be critical to achieving bilingual proficiency and for new adult second language learning. The native language may change as a second language is learned. And adult second language learners may, in particular, the individual differences we see among them may be related in part to the ability to undergo those changes. And in um, sort of colloquial American English, <laughs> I, I use this phrase and, and don't want it to be misunderstood. And so I'm going to say that the L1 takes a hit. And taking a hit sounds terrible. It sounds like a bad thing, something that you'd want to stay away from. I'm going to argue that the hit is actually a good thing, that we may need to as it were, suffer a little bit. We may need to have some, what in the memory literature has been called desirable difficulties. We may need to, in fact, endure the changes and the consequences that are imposed on us. And our native language may sometimes feel like we have attrition or that uh, we're more error prone um, and become less sensitive to the features of the L1. And what we want to argue is that these are dynamics that are normal dynamics of interaction across the two languages. They are not attrition. They are not a bad thing. They are a good thing. They are an important element in how second language proficiency uh, comes to be. Um, so we hypothesize that acquiring these regulation skills in the native language may at least in part be responsible for some of the cognitive consequences that have been associated with bilingualism. And I want to try to illustrate this in some experiments that we have performed. And again, I'm going to go very quickly and try to be aware of the time and uh, just give you a little bit of a flavor of how this research is done. So one question we've asked is how quickly in learning a second language um, does the effect of the second language on the first come in place? Uh, this is a study that was performed with my former graduate student, Kinsey Bice, uh, at We did this at Penn State. Um, and this was a study that was performed with native English speakers who were enrolled in Spanish classes. Now, uh, I'm going to almost caricature Central Pennsylvania. If you live in Central Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania is a very English monolingual space. There are people who live who, who do speak other languages, there are a lot of international students, but it's a very monolingual English place. And so here, if you're learning, if you sign up to take a Spanish class, um, you're going to hear Spanish in the class, but you're also going to have a lot of English in the environment around you. The question we had is how permeable is your English? When does your English begin to be affected by what you're learning in Spanish? And so what we did is we asked these students to perform a lexical decision task. Lexical decision is a psycholinguistic task where you're shown, it's very simple at the lexical level, you're just shown a string of letters and you're asked, is this a real word in this language? And sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. And you just press a button one way or the other. And the twist in this experiment is that we sometimes had words in English that were cognates with their translations in Spanish. So for example, you could have a word like tomato in English, which is a cognate with a tomate in Spanish. Um, you could have a word in English like book, which is not a cognate, um, where the translation in Spanish is libro. The question is, if you are just processing English, which is your native language, does the Spanish come to affect your English. Now, what we did is we compared monolingual speakers of English in this very monolingual place who have no reason to know any Spanish um, with learners who were at very early stages of learning Spanish. Some learners were right in the very first semester of learning Spanish. Others were a little bit farther along. We looked at the time it took them to press a button. Yes or no, is this word in English? a uh, real word? Is this, is this a uh, string of letters a real word? What we found is that behaviorally, the learners looked like monolinguals. It looked behaviorally like there was no effect of the Spanish that they were learning. 
But then we looked at their brain. We used uh, event-related potentials. We used electrophysiology, and I'm not going to have time today to go into the details of this particular neuroscience method, but essentially it's looking at brain waves. And we asked the question is, does brain activity reflect this influence? And what we found is that it does. And what you see is that what you have on the left are monolinguals, you have beginning learners, and you have intermediate learners. For our purpose today, the critical thing is what happens between that red and black line. And what you see, the red are the non-cognates, or the or like book libro, and the black are the cognates, the um, uh, words like tomato and tomato. And what you see is that you begin to see separation between the lines, and that that separation is significant once you get to be an intermediate learner. Intermediate learners are not proficient bilinguals in Spanish. They're just beginning to get a handle on Spanish. And yet what you see is that their brains are being changed in ways that suggest that it's the L1 that's being changed, not just the L2. This is performance in English for these native English speakers. And their English, although they may not be aware of it, is coming to be affected by what they know in Spanish. Um, so the idea here is becoming bilingual is not just about learning the L2, it's also about the way the dominant language changes. And we've looked at this in a variety of different ways in two particular contexts in which we argue that the native language may take a, what I'm calling a hit. Um, one is when learners are immersed in an L2 environment during study abroad or travel. Um, so if you're an international student and you're studying elsewhere, um, the question is we can ask, what happens to your native language? Um, we can also simulate this in the laboratory when bilinguals are asked to speak their L1 after they've been asked to, after they've spoken the L2 for a while. And I'm going to, again, just try to very briefly illustrate this. Uh, this is a study that was performed with a former graduate student at Penn State, Jared Link, um, who went to Salamanca, Spain um, because he had been an international student on study abroad in Salamanca. And uh, we looked at individuals who were intermediate learners of Spanish, native English speakers, intermediate learners of Spanish. They were not proficient in Spanish. So they are dominant in English as a native language. They traveled to Spain, hopefully to become more proficient in Spanish. Um, and we compare their performance to performance of native English speakers in Pennsylvania learning Spanish as a second language. And what we see in these studies, and I'm just going to present a little snippet of the data, but what we see in these studies is that the native language, English, is suppressed when the learners are in the second language Spanish environment. And here's how we did it. In this study, we asked one of the tasks among many, we asked uh, our participants to perform, was a semantic verbal fluency or category fluency task. What happens in this, in this kind of experiment is you say to someone, I'm going to name a category, and in the next 30 seconds, I want you to simply say, if all the exemplars of the category you can think of as quickly as possible. So it's a game you can play at a party and you say to someone, fruit, and then they say, you know, apple, pear, banana, lemon. I just illustrated it here in this picture. Um, so what do you expect? You expect that if these uh, students are all native English speakers who are not that proficient in Spanish, they should produce more in English than in Spanish. And that's what happens. Do you see how the English bars are higher than the Spanish bars? They produce more in English. And in Spanish, what you see is that the black filled bars are higher than the open bars. What that means, it's good. It means that the students who were immersed in Spain could produce more Spanish than the students who were just in the classroom. So that's a point for study abroad for international travel. The critical data in this study are on the left. And what we see here is performance in English, which is their native language. And do you see how the black bar is lower than the empty bar? Well, what does that mean? It means that the immersed learners, these individuals who were in Spain, could speak less English when they were in Spain. Their English was suppressed, even though English was their dominant language. Um, and so what it suggests is that 
the English is taking a hit. There's something that changes in your native language when you're in this condition where you're exposed to the second language. Now, is this permanent? No. When they return, it pops back. Um, is this attrition? Not really. This is a dynamic change that occurs as a function of changing your environment. We have much, much more evidence for this in the laboratory where we perform experiments and ask people to speak their L1 or speak their L2. The data on the right are quite striking because these are prof proficient bilinguals in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, what we have here are we have data where uh, Dutch English bilinguals spoke Dutch or English in response to seeing a picture. And we just said, What's the name of that picture? Very, very simple task. And uh, you, as you would expect, if you're a Dutch English bilingual, even though you may be pro very proficient in English as a second language, Dutch is your native language and your dominant language. You should be faster to speak Dutch than to speak English. And if you look at the blue bars in this graph, you see the blue here on the left and the blue on the right. This is L1, which is Dutch, L2 is English. You see the Dutch is faster than the English it should be. But then what happens if I mix the two languages together and I give you a cue that tells you whether you should be speaking Dutch or whether you should be speaking English, but from moment to moment you don't know which language you're going to speak. What happens is that the Dutch, the L1, takes a big hit. You see the very, very long reaction time, response time to speak Dutch. So now we find that not only are you slower to speak Dutch, you're actually slower to speak Dutch than to speak English. And so we have reversed the dominance of your two languages temporarily within this experiment. It suggests that the native language or the dominant language may be suppressed to enable the planning of the second language. And this is just another illustration in a study of uh, Mandarin English speakers, again asking people to name pictures. Uh, we did a study where we asked them to name pictures, the same pictures in both languages. If you look at the pictures on the bottom, you see that they're all the same pictures, they're in some different order, but they're the same objects. Um, and again, very simple, just say what you see. And the trick in the experiment is that some people named first in their uh, native language, which was Mandarin, and then in the second language, which was English, and other people did the reverse. They named first in English and then in Mandarin. And what you would expect is if you name the same thing twice, you might expect that you're going to be facilitated. You're going to experience a kind of priming effect by naming the same thing twice. And the question we asked is, would that be true if you were crossing language? And what we found, we did this experiment using, again, using brain waves. We look at uh, event-related potentials using electrophysiology. And I'm showing you a tiny little bit of this. This is from where, and this, this is not an invasive uh, method for those of you not familiar with electrophysiology. We simply have a cap on your head and we're looking at the uh, electrical activity at the level of the scalp. Uh, CZ uh, is just the electrode that happens to be right at the center of your head. And what we're looking at here is the difference between first seeing the object named in your L1 and then in the L2 or first in the L2 and then in the L1. What we see on the right is when you're naming in the L2 after you've named in the L1. And do you see how the red, the red line, the red uh, EEG uh, record is, is below the blue line? What that means in this uh, context is it means that you are showing less negativity in your brain waves. And what we think that means, is we think that means you're facilitated. So you've seen the same thing, you said it in your native language, and now you say it in your second language, it helps to have seen it. You have facilitation. But what do we see on the left? What we see on the left for the L1 is exactly the opposite. We see a pattern that is consistent with inhibition. The red, that red curve is now above the blue curve. We see more negativity in the EEG record when you named your, in Mandarin in this case, after having spoken English for a while. So speaking your L2 seems to have this effect on later speaking your L1. And what we've shown and others have shown is that if we're mo a matter of momentary 
recovery that you were speaking your L2 and you've got to recover the L1, you might think you'd quickly see this bounce back. It turns out that it's quite persistent. It does eventually return, but that you see it persist for quite a long period of time, suggesting that there may be some global components in this inhibitory mechanism. And studies have shown you get this with a brief exposure to the L2 and then switching back to your L1. Um, is this just about words? Is it just about the lexicon? Well, no, there's research by my colleague Julie Jucius at Penn State showing that you get it for the grammar. There's an effect of the L2 on the L1 and the grammar. And Charles Chang at Boston University has shown this for the phonetics. Um, so what we see is we see there are these persistent effects of the L2 and the L1. And again, is it attrition? No. We want to argue that these are the ordinary dynamics of bilingualism, that the two languages are always changing as a function of which one you just spoke and the context in which you spoke it. So the claim that we want to make, and understanding this is a little bit of a joke slide, but that the native language is not the rock of Gibraltar. It's not stable. The L2 has persistent effects on the L1 for learners, for highly proficient bilinguals, um, and these cross-language interactions come to change both languages. They come to change the native language as well as the second language, and the evidence on brain imaging suggests that the two languages sit roughly in the same place in the brain. It's the same neural tissue that's supporting both languages. One implication, and we can come back to this later on, is that the kind of monolingual native speaker model that we have in so much of linguistics and so much of psycholinguistics is probably not the right model. That the goal of, uh, certainly for adult L2 learners, the L2 learner needs to become not a native speaker, monolingual speaker of the other language. They need to become a bilingual speaker. And the idea that this may not be just about individuals, but also about context, has been articulated uh, in a very important uh, framework uh, published by David Green and Juvan Abachalebi, who we've mentioned earlier today, uh, and in something that they call the adaptive control hypothesis. The idea is that the way two languages are used actively is going to impose demands that create distinct profiles of bilingual cognition. And different forms of bilingualism are going to have the consequence of tuning the neural networks that support language use. Some bilinguals code switch frequently, others don't. Some bilinguals use two languages that have similar form, others do not. In all cases, bilinguals are going to have more competition than monolinguals, but the way that competition is manifest is going to be different for different types of bilinguals. And some of these conditions may produce cognitive consequences of the sort that we've mentioned, others may not. We need to understand when they do and when they don't. So I want to ask in this final portion of the talk, I want to ask what language processes might affect regulation and coordination of these cognitive resources. Code switching certainly may be one of them. Uh, social networks and language decision making. People live in social communities. They, those social communities determine who you speak with and which languages you speak with them. And this has just been investigated in the recent sociolinguists have been looking at this for many, many, many years. Uh, psycholinguists, cognitive neuroscientists have just begun to take seriously the idea that we live in a social world and we need to take into account that social context. I've already talked a little bit about language immersion being important. And one of the things I want to say about language immersion is that language immersion is not just the situation where a person goes from their L1 environment to their L2 environment. We are all immersed all the time. Some of us live in contexts where we're bilingual and everyone in the environment speaks the same languages. Some of us are immersed in contexts where there are people who speak languages that we don't speak, or we speak languages that they don't speak. And so we have to think about immersion in a much broader sense than we have in the previous literature. Finally, there's an issue about linguistic diversity. Some live in environments like the character I've given you of central Pennsylvania, monolingual English, English only. Other people live in environments, like the one I live in here in Southern California, where 
lots of other languages are spoken. You walk down the street, you hear uh, Spanish, you hear Korean, you hear Mandarin, uh, you hear Vietnamese. Uh, so the point is that we're in an environment, whether or not you speak those languages, you hear them. And we need to understand what the consequence of the ambient linguistic environment might be. So very, very quickly, I want to try to illustrate this, and then I will wrap up and leave some time for questions. So code switching. Code switching is, a, of course, a topic unto itself. There is a lot to say about code switching, and I'm not going to be able to cover that uh, today. One of the important things about code switching is that it, it may be one of the most misunderstood uh, and, and mythologists sources of mythology about bilingualism. Many uh, people out in the public think, oh, if people code switch, it's a deficit. It means that you don't have the words, or you don't have the sentences, or you don't have the knowledge. And what we know now is nothing could be uh, less true, <laughs> that code switching is a finely tuned skill. It's a kind of athleticism. And the picture I have of it here is the idea of having tango dancers uh, who have aligned to one another and learned to dance with one another. Well, code switching may in fact be a kind of linguistic tango. Uh, it may be that kind of alignment may be in fact an index of this language regulation that I've been talking about. We don't know much about how the richness of the linguistic or cultural context of affects that tuning, but studies are beginning to investigate that issue. So how does code switching affect coordination? In one study um, performed by Melinda Fricke, who was a former postdoc working with Julie Ducius and myself when we were at Penn State, um, we asked this question by asking the question of what bilinguals here in the environment that might cue them, that might tip them off, that a code switch is about to occur. And um, models of, bi of alignment in uh, psycholinguistics assume that speakers and listeners um, align to each other, um, they entrain to one another so that they begin to be able to predict what's going to come up. The idea in this study was that in fact, bilinguals who code switch may begin to generate predictions about upcoming code switch speech on the basis of very subtle phonetic cues they hear in the discourse. And what we did in this study is we did a corpus analysis and then we did an eye tracking study. I don't have time today to go into all the details, but basically for Spanish English bilinguals, what we were able to show is that speech rate slows down prior to a code switch. English becomes more Spanish-like. You then look at bilinguals who are presented with these subtle cues, and it turns out they can more effectively predict. They can use, they can exploit that phonetic information to predict that a switch is coming up. But not all bilinguals code switch. Some bilinguals do, some don't. Some are dominant in their native language, some are do become dominant Heritage speakers who have a home language other than the community language often become dominant in the community language by virtue of circumstance. They have to go to school and be educated in the community language. And as I said, some individuals live in a context where others are similarly bilingual and, and others live in places where, where very few people are, are bilingual in the same way. In a recent study um, led by Annie Beatty Martinez, who is uh, currently a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University, um, she led a study where we asked this question about bilinguals who were all proficient speakers of Spanish and English. They were native Spanish speakers who were proficient in English as a second language. But critically, they lived in three different places. One group lived in Granada, Spain. In Granada, Spain, Proficient Spanish-English bilinguals at the university can speak both languages, use both languages very well. However, the two languages are used separately. Spanish is used as the language of the community, as the language of the home, and English is used as the language of work or the language of schooling. And most of these bilinguals in Granada do not code switch with one another. In contrast, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, we see a situation where people are proficient Spanish-English bilinguals, but either language can be used opportunistically. There's a lot of code switching, and there's not so much separation between 
home and community and work and school, Spanish and English can both be used. And then we see this environment that I've talked about already today, State College, Pennsylvania. At Penn State in central Pennsylvania, which is this very monolingual English space, that what we see is that if you're an international student if you're, or if you're a person who speaks a, a U.S. student from Puerto Rico, for example, who speaks uh, Spanish, you can't assume that everyone on that campus is going to be able to speak Spanish with you. In fact, there are very few Spanish speakers at Penn State. So what you see is that individuals who are immersed in English as their L2, but where Spanish is their L1, are going to have to monitor the environment for who, with whom they can speak Spanish. And so they're going to have diverse conversational exchanges in which language membership is going to be crucial. It turns out that these contexts are critically important for understanding how bilinguals, all of whom are proficient Spanish-English bilinguals, recruit cognitive resources. And the way we looked at this was using a cognitive task uh, that's been used to assess executive function and cognitive control. I don't have time today to go into this in gory detail, but here's the idea. The idea is that we can assess cognitively how well you can be cued to expect that an event is coming, make a prediction. It's called the AXCPT, AX Continuous Performance Task, and it's been used to look at how cognitive mechanisms may be controlled either proactively, what's coming up, or reactively, what came up that needs to be ignored. And so the idea is that you perform this little cognitive task, and most of the time you get to, if you see an A, you expect an X, but sometimes you see a Y. And so what you can do is you can assess this cognitive control and then ask the question, how is it engaged when bilinguals in these different contexts are just doing this simple picture naming task that we've talked about already? So what do we see? I'm showing you only a little bit of the data. The data here, and, and you don't need to worry about the meaning of all the, meaning of all the uh, measures here, but AY error is a measure of uh, proactive control. It's a measure of how well can you predict what's coming up. What we see is a really interesting finding in this study was for these Spanish-English bilinguals at Penn State in State College, where they were immersed. And when they have high proactive control, they can maintain Spanish. So they are predicting what's going to happen in the environment to be able to keep their Spanish, to not lose their Spanish, to not succumb to the environment. And so it supports the idea uh, that was uh, articulated by the adaptive control hypothesis that language use determines cognitive engagement. In previous studies, all of these people would have been collapsed into the same, into the same group. Now, many people out there have been investigating these issues of how the environment, the context, affects cognitive engagement. Um, another effort, and again, I'm not going to describe this in any detail, but Jason Gulliver and Deborah Titone at McGill have been investigating this using a measure called language entropy. And the idea here, it's kind of social network uh, model. And the idea is that um, people live in different social networks. And if you're in a social network where you have to speak different languages to different people in different contexts, you're going to be engaging the two languages quite differently than if you use the same languages in each context in a very consistent way. And what they've shown is they've shown that this affects not only behavior, it affects the brain. And so it's not only about immersion, it's about how you're immersed, where you're immersed, and how you're using the two languages. One of the most amazing findings that's been reported in the recent literature is a study out of University of Florida from Edith Kahn's group um, showing that when individuals who are Spanish English code switchers are reading sentences and having their brains, uh, you know, brain activity monitored using EEG, um, that their brain activity when they encounter a code switch in a sentence changes if there's another bilingual person in the room. 
Bilinguals show less of a cost of code switching when they're with another bilingual who is a potential code switching partner. It's entirely a social consequence. These are the very same people. They're influenced by the nature of the context. Um, so I want to go back at the very end to this question of linguistic diversity because we have a result that was really quite unexpected. It was quite uh, quite quite serendipitous. Um, in 2016, I moved from Pennsylvania, this monolingual place I've been talking about, to California, which is a very linguistically diverse environment. And so this final example looks at what happens in these two environments, um, the monolingual environment and the linguistically diverse environment. One of my students at Penn State, who I've mentioned already, Kinsey Bice, uh, was doing her PhD at Penn State at the point in 2016 where I decided to move my faculty position and she um, she decided that she would come with me uh, and uh, she came with me but she was right in the middle of her dissertation and so she had to collect half the data in Pennsylvania half the data in California and here's what she did she did a study and again I'm not going to go into any of the gory details she did a study where she taught Spanish English bilinguals and English monolinguals Finnish vowel harmony. And you might scratch your head and say, huh? Why Finnish vowel harmony? Well, Finnish vowel harmony is a rule that exists in Finnish that does not exist in Spanish or English, and it's a hard rule to learn. And she had the idea that a lot of the studies on bilingual learning had used tasks that were simply too simple. So this is hard. And what she did is she brought people into the lab day after day. She taught them Finnish vowel harmony. Everybody learned it. And she monitored their brain activity using electrophysiology as they learned it. And then what she did is she did something really critical. She brought them back a week later and presented them with some examples of Finnish vowel harmony violations that they hadn't heard before. And the question was, would their brains be able to pick up those violations, even if it was an example that they hadn't learned? It was an untrained example. And in behavior, nobody seemed to generalize. Her, these are monolinguals who are in the two. The, it turned out the monolingual controls in these two places were the most interesting results of all. But here's what she found. She found, do you see the red hot brain on the left and the cool green brain on the right? Her monolinguals in Pennsylvania, they showed nothing in behavior, they showed nothing in the brain. So they didn't, they didn't seem to be sensitive to finish vowel harmony a week later. However, monolingual speakers living in Southern California show sensitivity and brain activity a week later when they're presented with these novel examples. What does that suggest? Their brains look more bilingual. They don't speak another language. They are monolingual, but they're living in a linguistically diverse environment. This was not the reason we did the study. It was a serendipitous result. We have to be very cautious about interpreting it. Uh, if anything, those in the diverse environment had a lower uh, socioeconomic status than those in the less diverse environment, so against the finding. Um, so once the pandemic is really over, we're very, very eager to investigate just what the consequence of this linguistic diversity is on learning and language processing. But it's very exciting because it suggests that living in a linguistically diverse environment may really facilitate new learning. So, wrapping it up, uh, coming back to the controversy that I mentioned at the start, um, our question is how can we begin to understand the causal mechanisms that underlie these consequences of bilingualism? We hypothesize that the regulation of the native or dominant language is crucial. I've tried to convince you that it happens, that we see evidence for it, and now the trick is to try to connect that evidence to these cognitive consequences. Um, we see that these consequences vary dramatically for proficient bilinguals in different interactional contexts, and even for monolingual speakers who happen to find themselves in contexts that vary in linguistic and cultural diversity. So language immersion, again, is not just about the L2. To bring it together, we think we need to capture the social and linguistic diversity of language to develop models that account for these dynamic changes that occur across interactional contexts. The findings I've reported 
in a very preliminary way, point to a set of possible mechanisms for understanding the consequences of bilingualism and how what bilinguals do with language may produce cognitive and neural change. So it's not just that there are different types of bilinguals and monolinguals, but those differences have implications for how linguistic and cognitive resources are engaged. Uh, there's a recent paper that I just mentioned that's a cognitive paper that uh, reviews the evidence on variation and claims that if we look across a incredibly broad spectrum of studies that look at variation in all sorts of different cognitive domains in addition to language, that we see that variation facilitates learning. So we need to be modest because there is a huge amount that we don't know. Um, and what I've done here is just to list a set of very preliminary uh, points of what we don't know. We don't know what changes are enduring and which ones are what I'm calling a flash in the pan that occur but then maybe disappear. We don't really understand very well the relationship between language regulation and cognitive control. Uh, they seem to engage related brain networks, but they may not be identical. We need to understand more about the plasticity in early childhood and then for adults. Um, we need to understand what it means to be a native speaker and what it means to abandon the ideal of the native speaker in the way it's been conceptualized in the past. And we need to pay much more attention to what the languages are themselves. On the science, I want to argue we would know none of this if we studied monolinguals alone, and that the implications are not just for our interest and curiosity, they require a revision of the traditional stories about language development, about cognitive control, and about the plasticity associated with language experience. We need to focus on a range of bilingual speakers to reveal the variation in language learning and language use and context that shapes the dynamics of cognitive and neural engagement and ultimately these consequences of of bilingualism. And we invite you, I used to say, we invite you to visit our laboratory in Southern California when the pandemic is over. We're no longer saying that. We're just saying that when we find a moment of a COVID sweet spot. Thank you. And I'm going to unshare my screen so we can have discussion for the remaining time. Thank you, Judy. A wonderful presentation, I must say. Well, uh, people could uh, ask questions or provide comments. Please raise your hand. It is on reactions so that you may participate. Well, I have myself, I've written down a lot of things here. I don't know where to start from. I mean to say, from the very, very beginning, I noted the switch strategy. How much do we switch? And then you continue, we, you develop your discussion, and you come down language, switching, and mixing. So you covered some of my first thoughts. I mean to say, these are this switching is very, very important. <laughs> I have my own examples, which I have in the long past and in the present. In the long past, in Sweden, we had a, a Canadian colleague, and sometimes we spoke with each other in English, and sometimes in Swedish. A lot of times we could not understand each other. And a lot of times she spoke to me and I couldn't understand because I guessed wrong the language she would use. And I had to adjust myself in order to understand. Right? So this switching, and if I take the present examples, now I'm learning uh, Spanish, uh, now, at this time, I was using my Greek phonetics. I was translating my Greek thoughts into Swedish. But now, I don't do that. I speak Spanish directly 
and I had, I don't have to 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 to, to translate to think in Greek and Latin because I've learned the business, I suppose. And and what's important about your example is that it the it's very much the case that what this research is suggesting now is that it's not just about switching; it's about who you're switching with and what that what what the demands of that situation look like um and so you have two things that are going on here one is about the context and and who it is you're talking to but the other is about your own development of proficiency so we need to look at the developmental questions and this is something that that is being examined that we need to look at the developmental questions within individuals and how you change in terms of issues of proficiency whether you need to translate whether you need to uh, uh, rely on other language knowledge in a, in a given instance and who with whom you're um, you're, you're speaking um, and it's that social part of it that that's new in the in the evidence that that we and others have. It's it's that social part of it and what those demands are that are now now seem to be changing even for individuals who are at a particular point in their achievement of proficiency in the two languages. So both things are going on at once. I think there's a hand raised here by uh, Sabia. Uh, I see uh, Anna pa Anna Paula would uh, we have we have questions in the chat but then there's a hand yes, raised in the audience them? I can read I can read those but ah, okay, okay. Oh, oh is that what but okay um okay Irati uh is asking about right the this is from uh the the map of the U.S. Uh, with the hotspots is from uh, Serene, Sarah Serene and uh, Gigi Luck, L-U-K. And I can send you, if you email me, I'll be happy to send you the reference to their to their work, but you can also Google it. Um, and then um, Anna uh, is asking what the literature says about the impact of the context in which the L2 is learned and the age at which exposure begins. And all of those things are important. I think that one of the things that has become a focus in the recent work is to say that we look at the research and we have these very siloed, very compartmentalized areas of research in the literature on, you know, infants and, um, young children and young adults and then older adults. Um, but we tend not to look at how uh, the early life uh, language experience comes to affect uh, language processing and cognition later. Um, and of course, all of that is affected by the context in which the L2 is learned and the context in which it's uh, uh, use the age and the, the context. Um, where we see um, very tantalizing findings are, for example, in the research that's been uh, reported by people like Lara Pierce, um, who has uh, reported starting with her dissertation at McGill University, she reported a set of fascinating results about international adoptees who were, um, as, as babies, adopted as from China um, by French speaking parents in Montreal. And her studies show that if you look at these individuals when they become teenagers or uh, young adults, that they behaviorally, they have no memory of the Chinese at all. That it's not, there's no, no conscious awareness um, of then what they heard was only in the first year of life when they, before they were adopted. Um, and what she shows is that if you look at their brains, that what you see is that their brains, they're not exactly like bilingual brains, but they're somewhere between monolingual and bilingual brains. So the point is that there is something left of this early 
language exposure and of this early experience. And one of the things that we're investigating in my lab right now is that we are um, beginning to look at the experience of different types of heritage speakers who've had different types of early home experience. And so, for example, in one study, um, we have data um, showing that the language in which uh, heritage speakers acquire literacy. So for example, for Spanish English speakers, if they learn to read in Spanish or in English, seems to affect their grammatical processing um, in the two languages when they're young adults. And uh, we, we've just begun investigating um, these issues. So I think, uh, I think understanding what these consequences are, how the age effect uh, plays out, and also how the con context uh, uh, manifests itself is going to be crucially important. Um, okay, Sabia um, has a question. Hi, yes, thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Um, I actually had a question about one of the most brilliant papers I've ever heard uh, and I've ever read um, with, uh, with you, uh, Professor, and also with um, your colleague, uh, Baisi. And it's about the processing in the two languages with ERPs. Um, basically, I was interested in one of the claims that were made that basically bilinguals use the same underlying mechanism to process both languages. However, there is increasing research uh, using EEG and looking at processing profiles where they look at the processing profile in DL1 um, and then in DL2, and they find that people show differential response dominances. So for instance, an N400 in DL1 <coughs> and then a P600 as a processing profile in DL2. And I was wondering to what extent can we <clears throat> actually and disentangle the two because these two processing profiles are attributed to potentially sensitivity to specific properties of a stimulus. And if there is this cross interaction, I was wondering what factors do you think might be driving this differential profile in the two languages of the same individual? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really good question, and it's a it's a, it's an area of research that I think is very open to investigation. Um, the study that you mentioned is one that Kenzie Bice um, and I published uh, that I didn't talk about today, uh, where we looked at these different uh, N four P six uh, components in uh, grammatical processing. Um, I think that. You know, I, I, I think we don't fully understand what those individual differences mean uh, in terms of engaging cognitive support during language processing. Um, and my sense is that we, we need to focus on both, we really need to put all of this together. So we need to focus both on what those individual differences mean within and across the two languages. And I think we need to ask how that's how how it's influenced by um you know by by all of these other factors that i've talked about um i think that if you can show in that uh edith khan study that i mentioned on code switching um if you can show that what we see in these components um in the erp is affected um by who's sitting next to you then um it means that we have a really hard task to perform now because we really need to figure out how to characterize um, both the people and the environments and i think and i think until we do that we're just not going to be able to answer the question that you've you've asked which is very important i think there are going to be multiple determinants and we're, it's going to take a bit of research to dig in and figure out whether which of them is most affected by you know by the individual uh you know what the individual brings to the situation and and what is affected by what the situation brings to the individual but thank you for that question. It's a very, very good question. Thank you very much. Okay. We have, um, we have two more questions. Okay. Saha Fang. Hi. Uh, so thank you very much for this um, very informative talk. Um, I have a very basic and concept question. Uh, I was wondering, in your opinion, um, if, if there's a distinction between um, bilinguals and second language learners 
um, I think this question matters, particularly when we're trying to characterize uh, the target population in question. Um, so I just wondering, like, what, what is your opinion about that? Okay, I think that um, one of the things that uh, is very striking to me is that we tend, we, we humans tend to live in a world at every level where things end up being polarized or um, forced into binary categories. And so in early in my career, I was asked over and over again, are you studying bilinguals? Are you studying second language learners? Are you studying foreign language learners? Or who are these people? And, and I guess what I've come to, and of course I have a perspective that, that may be different than some of you because I, I'm not, my training is not as a linguist. My training is as a psychologist. And my perspective is that um, all of these things are all all of these different forms of using more than one language are drawing on the same underlying mechanisms but perhaps in some different ways depending upon the context and the level of learning so i think that it's not that i think that early learning has no consequences i think it does the work that i mentioned on infancy uh, we don't know whether individuals exposed to two languages as infants even if they don't become bilingual um take that away you know whether whether the openness of the speech system makes them more open to language learning later um in some different different way and i think the way we typically think about second language learners is we think about late second language learners who are adults and coming to the second language after they have a a kind of very clear uh native or first language. So do I think that there are some things that are different? Absolutely. I th and I think that there's uh, evidence that the brains of early simultaneous bilinguals look a little bit different than the brains of later bilinguals. But do I think these are really different things? No, I don't. I think that this is a matter of degree. And I think it's a matter of understanding um, to what extent are there different mixes of factors that may come to uh, influence the way we, uh, you know, the way we model uh, the trajectory and, and consequences for individuals. One thing we do know is that in the research looking at the cognitive consequences of bilingualism, where people have been arguing and there's controversy about whether there are positive cognitive consequences, we do know that um, you can see those consequences even for individuals who are acquiring the language late. And so I think we need to take that bit of data seriously. There are a set of studies that are being done at different, different labs around the world asking the question actually for older adults, what happens if you learn another language in old age. And uh, some people have been talking about this as a kind of cognitive vaccine. Uh, and I think the uh, the claim is that new learning in general may be good later in life, but new language learning may be particularly good. And so I think we have to stay tuned for the results of those studies. But again, it suggests that um, it's never it's never too late. And it doesn't mean that these different, you know, different ways we've thought about this in the past are, don't have some merit to them. That doesn't mean that there aren't differences. It just means that we need to have a conceptualization that's going to place them uh, in this in this theoretical framework in a way that we can understand. We have one last question, Christina. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, and my question is, uh, about uh, languages which are structurally similar to each other because in your presentation we uh, just uh, uh, saw examples mainly when uh, the two languages were structurally different enough uh, there were uh, 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 disclaimers that uh, this result is only uh, valid when uh, there is a structural uh, difference between two languages so I was just wondering when you presented uh, the experiments with the cognates and non-cognates, uh, how is it with the ERP correlates if we have uh, two similar languages 
you know, because uh, sometimes you can even uh, not uh, distinguish a language and the dialect. So how is it if uh, we have a speaker with two Chinese dialects, which are not mutually intelligible, or uh, two Slavic languages, which are uh, two different languages? at least uh, classified uh, as they are, but uh, they are mutually intelligible. So uh, what about the ERP correlate? Uh, I would expect a less robust difference, but on the other hand, as far as I remember, I read a study which showed more robust uh, ERP correlates uh, with regards to phonological mapping if uh, the participants were asked to differentiate between uh, regional uh, dialects uh, and between uh, languages. So uh, to me, it is a bit uh, contradictory. That's why uh, I had this question. And thank you so much. Thank you. It's a very good question. And it's one that I get very often. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's clear that I mean, languages differ. We have many different pairings of languages and dialects, for that matter. Um, and I think that the answer I have to the question is that it's not that I don't think language difference matters. I think it does matter. I think there, there are differences and may matter structurally, typologically, whether you have the same writing systems or not. I mean, whether you have, we've done this work on sign language for bimodal bilinguals where, you know, it's an entire one language is spoken with, articulated with the hands. And and here's what I, what I think. What I think is that the kinds of mechanisms that I'm talking about here are more abstract. I think that this is about what it means to have two languages and uh, how they interact with one another and how they create consequences. Are those consequences identical for all language pairings? I don't think so. And I think we already have evidence that that's the case. Um, and there are ERP studies that, that look at some of this. I've presented some data here from languages that are more similar, like Dutch and English or uh, even Spanish and English versus, you know, Mandarin and English. Um, but I think it's not that there aren't differences, but I think that the mechanisms that I'm describing are fundamentally the same across all these languages. And that's been shocking, right? Why, how could it be that both languages come online? If I'm, if I can't read Mandarin, which I can't, and, and I see a page in Mandarin, I, my English, it doesn't, I know it's not English and I know that I can't read it. But if you're a Mandarin English bilingual and you see those Mandarin characters, well, you also know it's not English. But yet what we see is that anything that's similar across the two languages, so if you can retrieve phonology that's shared, that that seems to be enough to drive these mechanisms. And so we, we see that evidence and we see it regardless of the similarity. So I think that part of this is not, it's not, again, it's not a binary. It's not one or the other. It's not that it doesn't matter what the languages are. It does matter. It's that, of course, it matters what the languages are. But the point is that at this level of analysis for the argument that I'm making here, um, it might not matter as much as you think it should. And I think that is a profound thing to say, because it means that there's something in the minds and brains of speakers of more than one language that is is blind and deaf to the um, properties of the other language in this way, which which is telling us something about bilingualism. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think that there are different different ways that we might, the research questions might start at different places um, to to really dig into the question of, of how these different, these language differences manifest themselves. And so I think it's a, a really important question and I think it's, it's one that we're beginning to understand a little bit, but I will, I, I will say that I, I do think that there are some bilingual general or multilingual general phenomena that may supersede those structural differences. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Well, uh, Judy, I have one last question. Can okay. you take it? Yeah, sure. The question is, 
is by a, bilingualism or learning a foreign language or speaking foreign language a brain an effective brain medicine yes i would like to believe it but what is the difference the difference between this medicine and doing mathematics or, and that's the question that's being asked everywhere. What a lot of other What's the difference between being an athlete and, and doing exercise and uh, increasing your, uh, right, your, your stamina that way? Um, and, and I think the idea here is that these are different illustrations of neuroplasticity. And bilingualism affects the brain and mind in ways that are similar and different than becoming a musician or, um, or playing video games um, in, at a very high level um, and, or, uh, you know, or being a, a super athlete. And, and it doesn't mean that all of these um, vaccines are, are going to have the same effect, and it doesn't mean they're all going to have the same effect on, this, on individuals. I mean, there, there's variation there as well. But what we know from the recent studies that have looked at the consequences of language training, language, you know, new language learning um, for, especially for older adults. And, and older adults are very critical in some ways because of their greater vulnerability. And what we see is that language seems to have a greater impact than other domains of learning and other types of vaccines. And so is it that you know, and we're certain we're living at a time where the issue of which vaccine is the best is a big issue. Um, but I think that we, you know, I think I, I, I think we don't, we don't know. Okay, okay. Even if we agree, one person who uses the second language a lot, you have a person A using the, language, the foreign language a lot, and another person not using the foreign language being a bilingual. The first person exercises every day. Exactly. That is and the they're... effect. The other, Absolutely. so bilingualism is not, is not per se the, the medicine. That's it's exactly exercise. the point. That's exactly the point. The and point also, is it's the way you when use we it. we speak foreign language, when we speak our, uh, our native language, we don't exercise a lot or we don't get tired. But when we speak a foreign language, we exercise more and we get more tired. No, that's exactly that's the good. point. That's good. That's good. And being <laughs> tired is what, when I say I hit, is being tired can be good. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for this. We have a continuation after your presentation during and after your presentation i've thought a good title a title code switching and language interactions mm -hmm. to summarize your research and your findings we will come back and talk about this or other things now we are we are planning to come with publications and volumes and you will be asked and very welcome to talk about this switching and language interaction and those things thank you very much thank you Indeed. thank you for and having me we have um some announcements um first we have updated upgraded our site which is not functioning as properly as we would like to but we are improving it and then we have the next conference in paris uh, in october and you are very welcome and philippe martin philippe are you here i am i am still here yeah good Philip will say he, he will be the chair of the conference no, uh, and just the word is yours, Philip. What I have to say that if you haven't been to Paris recently, 
there is an opportunity <laughs> to attend this conference. It's going to be the largest Textling conference. I think Professor Bottini has organized that for uh, almost 20 years, right, Antonis? Yes. And um, so it's going to take place, like I said, in Paris. It'll be hosted by, uh, you know, there are uh, about 13 universities in Paris, but it's going to be hosted by something, the university called Paris Cité, which is a new congregation of two different uh, two former universities. And um, my department is a linguistic department and specialize in uh, formal uh, uh, description of uh, languages with a formal, uh, with a formal attitude or formal approach, I should say. And um, uh, the district where it takes place, the 13th district has been developed uh, recently. It's completely different. If you haven't been there for, for a few years, you'll, you'll be, You'll be amazed. What, what that's a new Paris, but it's inside Paris. It's not in the suburb. It's in the, along the Seine River, and we expect to have a, a very good, a very interesting time. Uh, probably it's gonna. We hope it's gonna be the largest texting conference. We hope so, right, Antonis? And uh, other than that, the it's in Paris. So what should I say? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Philippe. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Judy. And thank now, you. Uh, that was our last tutorial. We will meet again after summer. Have a good, a rewarding summer and enjoy yourselves. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.